Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to introduce you now to two esteemed gentlemen. These gentlemen are preeminent authorities on the regulation of the legal profession and will engage each other in a spirited dialogue on this topic and the effect that digital technologies will have on our understanding of the profession and its re regulation. I, for one, for one, am very excited to hear their insights. Professor Thomas Gastaya is the chairman of the assembly at the Federal Bar for the Regulation of the Legal Profession. He will be joined on stage by Professor Hans-Jürgen Helwig, who is former president of the Councils of Bars and Law Societies of Europe. Gentlemen, the stage is yours. Good afternoon. My name is Thomas Gastaya. Um, and as you have heard, I'm chairing a committee. You, most of you probably have no idea what it is. So in Germany, lawyers can, to some extent, elect those to make the professional rules. And um, I am running one of these committees, which I think is highly interesting. Um, I should add that the following are, of course, only my very personal views. You are a very special crowd because Typically, if you talk to lawyers, accountants, doctors, and the like in Germany, no one is willing to address the issue of modern technical means or technology. We are all shy. So quite clearly, you are different. The others pretend that they can avoid the challenges of modern technology, and perhaps a few of them are lucky enough to actually do so. But the others are faced with the expectation of clients to improve their efficiency. Lawyers need to respond, and they have. The use of technology in the law is significantly and steadily increasing, but the awareness lags behind. Many colleagues might not even know that they are working in a cloud environment. And by using the word cloud, I mean my data on someone else's computer. I talked about this with a couple of vendors earlier today, and they acknowledged that they don't use the word cloud because it shies clients away. What else can I say about it? Legal tech is often related to cloud solutions. And legal tech, of course, affects the way we organize our own processes in the fields in which we can operate. And my belief is, th therefore, that we are not just talking about issues that affect organizations of a certain size or those who work on a transnational basis, but all lawyers. And my wish would really be that more lawyers are, get interested in what's happening and developing um, and see how they can use it for their own purposes. Why is there this reluctance? Our professional rules have for many years failed to appreciate how the technical environment affects our own life at home, but of course also the way we act as professionals in law firms, businesses, or state agencies. This has not been very helpful. We must face ways, a prudent way to deal with the issues of modern life. And this includes balancing risks against advantages. Cloud computing creates risks, of course. But on the other side, you can hardly dispute that a professional cloud provider can protect data much better than most professionals can do in their own office. The principle of prudence is often and rightfully asserted, and professional confidentiality, which we do not want to put at risk, is the very basis of our profession. But this should not cause us to neglect changing conditions 
In particular, technical developments. We should hope that prudence will not prevent us from the expedient use of technology where this is now legally permitted. A couple of years ago, the Federal Lawyers Chamber initiated a discussion of how regulations should recognize IT and other related issues. Hans-Jürgen Helwig has greatly contributed to this reform of Section 2 Federal Lawyers Ordinance. The guiding thought was the principle that a professional may not be prohibited from using tools which everyone else uses with a good conscience. <laughs> the notion of socially adequate behavior as a safe harbor is a general applicable principle in German law. And this is what we try to replicate. The assessment was not shared by everyone at the Federal Ministry of Justice and Consumer Protection. And then the Minister of Justice promised to amend the laws to provide clarity and security for lawyers. This is the background of the recent amendments of our penal code and of the lawyer's ordinance. I mean, for those who are familiar with German law, it's sections 203 and 43 A and E. The legislative material uses the word cloud only once. But there is no doubt uh, that these sections relate to the use of cloud services by lawyers and in general permitted. Data protection law must also be observed, of course. <coughs> and the interesting relationship between the two is, is, is really noteworthy. A violation of professional rules and of data protection laws does not constitute a criminal offense under two or three German criminal code. On the other side, behavior permitted under the lawyer's ordinance um, makes clear that there can be no prof criminal offense either because all of a sudden a uh, disclosure is not any longer without permission. So in essence, we believe that the reform um, especially of section two or three, has limited the exposure of, of lawyers and set rules how we can use modern technology. I am about to give you the key points of this new um, set of regulations, but I must warn you, over the weekend I thought it would be helpful to translate the German um, <laughs> code into English and I assure you it was a painful exercise. The English version does not read any nicer than the German one. In a nutshell, you may employ suppliers and permit them access to confidential data to the extent this is required for their services. Okay, what does it mean? You can say you are free to decide whether you would like to employ them because you are free to organize your business. But if you have made this decision, then you can give them only those data that are required for their services. Breaches of confidentiality by these suppliers, but also by their staff, will be punishable under the criminal code, which is interesting because it's clearly an expansion of the reach of our criminal code. And it has an interesting aspect of extraterritoriality with it that I think no one really thought of. And perhaps we can later discuss a little bit on what it implies. So there are a couple of things that are not really new. You must warn your staff in text form that they need to observe confidentiality. You must diligently select your 
suppliers supervised them. If they are not reliable, you must immediately terminate them, other things that you would expect. Then comes a rather difficult issue. There is a difference between services exclusively designed to support a single mandate or case, and there the consent of your client is required. What means exclusively designed to support a single case? I think it could be considered unclear and probably refers to translators, experts, other advisors you would like to employ. And IT providers, like for e-discovery, um, other services in connection with laws, laws and investigations. The consent requirement does not extend to suppliers which maintain your infrastructure and therefore only indirectly support your activities. The term legal tech is rather broad and not very specific. The business models on the supply side vary equally. You heard earlier today that depending on your business model, you might even need um, a permit, um, um, as if otherwise you would violate our, I don't know the English terminology any longer, the main code on permitting lawyer services. And I was really wondering what type of permission you could get. There is a big debate on it, and I will not comment it any, any further. Um, there is still another hurdle that you should be aware of, and this is obtaining services from abroad. Unfortunately, there will not be a public authority or organization that explains to you whether you may receive the services from abroad because they find that in this other country there is an equivalent level of protection. This is now required by law. What do we mean by adequate level of protection? Well, it's outcome orientated. The question is whether the country where your supplier runs his server farm um, would do something against breaches of confidentiality were the consequence of deterrence. One wouldn't do it. The other construction would be to say, well, the country must have identical laws prosecuting those breaching the confidentiality. And if this construction was taken, which has no basis whatsoever in legislative history, the entire reform would be jeopardized because our set of, of laws is really unique um, in the EU or I think also in other countries in the sense that now um, a supplier, um, someone who handles your data warehouse um, or operates your cloud, can um, um, object to releasing the data and has legal standing is privileged. But how would you be able to determine whether such a level of protection really exists? That's a big issue at the moment. To some extent, you can rely on rulings of the European Commission in the context of data protection regulation. They have determined whether countries um, are safe in that sense. But this is a relatively small set of countries. In relation to the US, there is the EU US Privacy Shield, which is highly disputed and perhaps not a reliable basis. And on top of that, you must always remember that you also owe your clients protection on a contractual basis. If you have reason to suspect that their data will be subject to seizure in a certain country, it's probably not a good idea to send their data there, totally irrespective of any professional rules. Yeah. Um, 
The next question that you need to ask yourself, to what extent can you encrypt your data and keep your data encrypted? Um, because encrypted data that no one can read are never subject um, of, of violation of professional rules or of penal codes. Uh, and there we really hope that the industry would make some progress. Um, you can store them on an encrypted basis. I would expect that suppliers would increasingly favor this method because it prevents that their own employees commit a criminal breach of confidentiality. Um, but so far, at certain stages, at least if you use the cloud as a service or if you work in the cloud otherwise, you must decipher them and then everyone could theoretically read them. We need some progress on this level. So the last comment I'm, I'm going to make is that, of course, all of this is only new to lawyers and similar professions. All others um, have encountered the difficulties before. And there is the German Federal Office for Information Security, BSE, who has released many publications dealing with cloud services and others. And what we try to do in the committee is go through them and adjust them um, to the needs of professionals. We need to have something practical. And practical solutions might also emanate from a discussion that we will hopefully have in the coming time about a new section 2.7 um, of our professional rules, BORA, which for the first time, um, let's say, spells out something which is nothing new on the European level um, because the European Lawyers Association has, has repeatedly stated um, the, the principle there. Ensuring client confidentiality and security of client data has long been understood by lawyers in Germany as something defensive. If the state interferes by whatever methods, we would like to have the opportunity to protect the data. But our ambition goes much further. And we believe that client um, confidentiality is a concept which obliges us to actively see to it that client data are safe which of course means that we need to have the technical equipment and methods to do so. Final statement and a summary. We, and that is the lawyer's profession, but also the Ministry of Justice and Consumer Protection, we do not think that there is an irreconcilable gap between professional confidentiality and modern technology. We see tensions, but we believe that they can be controlled through appropriate organizational measures. And I'm turning over to you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, I'm, ladies and gentlemen. I'm glad to uh, follow up on uh, what my friend Thomas Gasta has just said, and I'll be drawing on uh, my experience from 20 years uh, as a member of a regulatory assembly with the German Federal Bar that Thomas Gasteyer mentioned. After 20 years, I thought that's enough and uh, I know the task is in good hands as you just uh, witnessed. And I'm also drawing on my experience, uh, not quite as long, but still over 10 years um, with uh, the Council of the Bars and Law Societies of Europe, the CCBE. Um, and uh, while working at the CCBE, I, I, I was uh, in official contact with the European Commission um, on some of the issues at stake also in the co connection with legal tech. And uh, uh, since I uh, left the presidency of the CCBE, I have uh, at regular intervals been contacted by the Commission um, in connection with uh, matters of professional regulation, uh, including the issue of monopoly, which um, uh, at least on the mind of some of bars and law societies um, is a matter of relevance in the context of legal tech. Um, 
the first remark I want to make is I was in touch, I got in touch with the issue of legal tech some 15 years ago, at a time when no one ever spoke of legal tech. And the reason is the following. My eldest daughter wrote her th thesis as a veterinarian by devising a computer program which would ask the veteran, which would have the veterinarian ask certain questions to the owner of the pet or identify certain appearances with the pet, a dog or a cat. And leading the veterinarian through the menu with ever more defined questions in the end would lead to the result that the computer would tell the doctor, in all likelihood the dog has this and the cat has that. And I felt, my God, what would that mean to the legal profession? Should that ever be installed and created such a program with the legal profession? And um, I, I talked to my daughter, uh, who had the idea of doing s such, a, such a computer program for the profession of a veteran. And he said, uh, veterinary, and, and, and she said, well, um, the, it occurred to me that there are recurring questions and um, that one can accelerate and make more efficient the work of a veterinarian um, as compared to going and starting from Adam and Eve um, again and again and again. And then I said by my, to myself, look, it's only a question of time and the same will happen with the lawyers. Uh, and that's exactly what has happened in the meantime. I want to put the issue legal tech in a, in a bigger context. The abbreviation, the part tech, stands for technology. It stands for technological progress. Now, we should not assume that this is a recent development. That process of substitution by technological progress is centuries old. Handwork was substituted for by machine work. That's what we call the Industrial Revolution. Think of the 19th century, the textile industries on the continent of Europe disappeared, they were overrun by the textile producing machines in England. That led to uprises, uh, civil unrest among the textile workers all over Europe, all over the countries that were concerned, Germany, France, and Italy even. And you know what the outcome was, no chance, the machines were more efficient. Hand labor was replaced by machine labor. And now what we are going through with legal tech is a substitution of head work by machine work. Um, it started with uh, computation computers, mathematical computations, complex mathematical computations. They were taken over by computers, i.e. by machines, but they did but the process didn't stop there. Um, um, we then, in the process of time, progress of time, computer-aided design in all sorts of industries was developed. And um, um, has the outcome been any different compared to the uprises uh, of textile workers? No. Um, the substitution process was successful. And when you now connect the element tech with the element legal, i.e. with the law, um, that has an implication, that look back into history, that has an implication at very first sight already, how should the development in the context with legal services, with the law, be any different from the context in the other environments that I've just described? Let's make a few Distinctions, ancillary activities. Lawyers used to write their briefs by hand themselves, way back, centuries back. Then secretaries were invented. They did the writing of briefs by hand. Then typing machines were invented. So they were able to replace themselves as a lawyer, first through human labor and then 
in part the typing activity of a much faster typewriter. Interesting to note, with these facilitation of legal services, everybody was happy. All, the, all members of the legal profession were happy because it made their life easier. Next ancillary activity. Again, a matter of technological progress. Communication with clients. Initially, meetings, then letters, then telecommunication by telephone. In the early days, telephone connections would be established by hand by an operator. And the operator, if she was curious, the operator, the she or he, could just stay on in the line and listen to everything. To the entire discussion between lawyer and client, which went right, which would have gone right to the heart of professional secrecy. Did the lawyers care about it? No, they kept telephoning. And they loved it because it made communication so much easier and faster. It was a significant improvement for secrecy when the hand-working operator was replaced by a machine to establish the connection. Initially, an, an analog machine and now a digital machine. Um, even with that kind of anonymization, demunization of making telephone connections possible, of enabling them, bringing them about, we still have the risk that the telecommunication can be tapped into by intruders that want to know, want to learn what is being talked about on the phone between the lawyer and the client. There can be hidden microphones in the conference room of the law firm. Uh, there can be long distance, highly sensitive microphones directed against the wall of this bill, of this room. And the one who's directing the microphone against the, the window of this room can listen through that microphone every single word that's being spoken here in this, in this conference room. Um, so there are continuing risks of technical progress for professional secrecy and nevertheless, and nevertheless we do make use of these telecommunication facilities. Um, they make our life easier. And that's good for us and that's good for, for, for the clients. And there is no, and that's the important element, no per se opposition against it. And there has been none over time. Um, there was no rejection of technical progress per se as a potential violation of professional secrecy. There are other ancillary activities that I would want to mention. Take process management. Process management, when, when a law firm, in particular a larger law firm with uh, several offices scattered all over the country, when they make a conflict check whether a given mandate would devile, uh, to, to accept a given mandate would be inconsistent with the prohibition of conflict rules, there's no better tool than a digital list of mandates, a brief description of mandates against which you can check, you can check a new mandate coming in, whether it's in conflict or not with existing mandates. Think about know-how administration. You do not, ha as a law firm, you do not have to reinvent the wheel again and again and again if you have a proper technologically, te technology-based know-how administration in which, of course, you will store masters from contracts, from letters and, and, and opinion letters that you have uh, drafted once and that can be used then in your further activities of your law firm. However, while most lawyers by today use telephones, there are still many lawyers that are lagging behind when it comes to process management and know-how administration. They are lagging behind and that shows when matters are getting complex, they have a complex relationship with technology, a difficult relationship with technology. They feel less at ease than with a telephone where they think they understand at least the technology, they master the technology, and they're not really aware of the risks connected with it. And that pro progress, process continues, i.e. feeling 
not so much at ease when we now are dealing, are, are addressing the core activity of a lawyer, namely rendering legal services. Many lawyers are opposed to the new technological developments different from their attitudes towards the ancillary activities that I've just described. The Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung only June this year had, a, had an article which says uh, lawyers and their fears with respect to artificial intelligence in connection with legal services. That headline said it all basically in, in one sentence. The lawyers and the bars in this connection take the following basic, uh, basic uh, uh, position. They argue the core values, i.e. the secrecy. Uh, and Thomas Gasteyer has just said that that argument, at least today, no longer holds true. The secrecy argument definitely cannot argue, cannot justify a per se opposition to legal tech. The use of legal tech for legal services, that's the second argument that's made, being made, is against the Berufsbild, the profile of the legal profession. That argument overlooks that the legal profile, the Berufsbild of a legal profession, is nothing but a factual description of a situation of the legal profession that exists from time to time at any given moment. The legal profile, the Berufsbild of a legal profession, does not have the force of law, and it can even less have the force of a per se prohibition. That is, standing case law by the, European, by the German Constitutional Court, and it is also case law by the European Court of Justice. There's a very, very significant case by the German Constitutional Court, the Bundesverfassungsgericht, the Masterpart case of 1997, which dealt with the question the following set of facts. Patent lawyers used to keep calendars which would remind them to remind their clients to renew the patent fee payments in order to maintain, to prolong the lifetime of the patent protection. So that was all done by hand. There was a hand carried calendar to then send the letter to the client. A computer program that was devised, which had all the data of when the payments would be due, and that would type automatically the reminder letter to the client. And that service provider was felt in violation of the monopoly for lawyers of legal services. And what did the Bundesverfassungsgericht say? They said, that used to be a legal service, but with the progress of technical development, that legal service now on the basis of the new technology has become a commercial service. And there's another element to the Berufsbild argument, and that is also case law by the European Constitutional Court, which is held in 2003, that the Berufsbild argument by lawyers and in particular by their organizations of the legal professions carry the specific risks that this argumentation is influenced by the group interests of the bars and law societies and their members and neglect the due respect for the freedom of profession for the competing service providers. So there is not only no normative power but as the Bundesverfassungsgericht has said, the Berufsbild argument has the imminent risk of a per se neglect for the freedom of the other service providers. Now, what are the real reasons then for um, the uh, critical, if not oppositionist, position? It's the fear of individuals for themselves. It's the disappointment that the position of the lawyers as the high priests of legal services will be gone. It is the failure to distinguish and to analyze really the set of facts and the consequences that must be distinguished. It is also the attempt to protect the competitive position of one's own 
and on the bars and law societies of the competitive position of the legal profession of at large, i.e. the monopoly of lawyers. That is clearly the pos in the focus of the European Commission. Uh, they dislike the monopoly of lawyers and they stress the freedom of professional service providers, in particular non-lawyers um, across the borders. And that brings me now to a brief comment on uh, the remark that you made, the, the difficulties of exterritorial effects of the, of the, of the new German uh, legislation. I think it's very questionable from the viewpoint of the fundamental freedoms of services across the border under union law, if the uh, state of destination, i.e. Germany, imposes sanctions under German criminal law on service providers from other countries, from other states of origin. And as regards the equivalency test, the issue that is imposed now by the German legislature, there is, a, of course, a, a big question mark to be, on, to, be, to, to be made, and whether the uncertainty in this respect is uh, really acceptable to EU law. Um, I could well imagine that this will be an issue that will be an issue that will play a major role under European law in the, in the future. What, I pl my, what my plea to you is, the oppositionists, those who are critical and skeptical for their own practices of law, they should accept the fact that history has shown technological developments are stronger than the monopoly of lawyers. There are certain matters that legal technology is better and faster at than human lawyers. To negate that fact, only weakens the monopoly. That is also a fact of historic experience in the, when looking backwards at the law on the monopoly of the legal profession. The lawyers in their practice, in my mind, should rather make use of the potentials that follow from the legal tech as new uh, developments for their own benefit and for the benefit of their clients. Um, this way, when a trying to make use of the possibilities in awareness that certain precautionary measures must be made. This way, the lawyers will remain the masters of legal tech and will not fall victim to legal tech. Let's take a look into history, specifically with respect to legal tech when it comes to the core activity of a lawyer. Lawyers do, used to do their research themselves. Then finally they in, invented a new instrument, namely an associate. And they asked an associate to do the research. And they felt nothing really about, about um, basic problems with the core values. Some professions in Europe did. They said it's inconsistent with the independence of a lawyer. But the independence issue is not a lawyer, is not an issue in Germany. If it's a lawyer issue for in Italy, Italy prohibits the employment of a lawyer by another lawyer. That's why a lawyer in Italy must, cannot be employed, he must be associated with another lawyer, but not so in Germany. Um, the, um, initially, employment in Germany of one lawyer by another lawyer was not provided for in the Federal Lawyers Act. Developments were stronger, the act was changed. You know the Juris system, that was developed some 20 or so years ago. There was no fundamental opposition when Juris came. All the lawyers were happy with it. They made use of it for their practice of law and they became the master of Juris. And all I do is I just urge lawyers that are skeptical about it, um, take the example of Juris. Just consider legal tech of today as a, an improvement to the juries that was invented some 20 years ago. In other words, take a differentiating, a distinguishing as look at the matter. And I give you one example. I was present, to, uh, it was one year ago, 
at an assembly, at a meeting of the member local bar associations of the German bar association, not the BRAC, the uh, Rechtsanwaltskammer, but the Deutsche Anwaltverein. And there were presentations by four legal tech pr service providers. And at the end of the meeting, they were all representatives from the one, more than 100 local bar association members of the DAV. They were all for legal tech because they had understood the message that is something that can be very useful. The legislator has acted already. Thomas Gast, I have uh, given you the modifications that were, that were just, uh, just recently um, enacted. Uh, in other words, the Berufsbild from yesterday has been modified and that will continue to be modified. So don't think that the Berufsbild is any of any importance and relevance in this context. I'm showing you here, uh, on this page, you just seen the logos and, and, and of legal tech providers. And the number is growing literally every week. It's gr growing literally every week. The last annual meeting of the G German Bar Association, the Deutsche Anwaltverein, had a, a, a very significant exposition of legal tech service providers. There was one not quite young anymore a gentleman going through that exhibition. He happened to be Dr. Beck, the owner of the Beck Publishing House. You are all familiar with that publishing house. When he left the exhibition hall, he had acquired three of these legal tech service providers to include them into the Beck Publishing House group. That shows how people really experienced in the developments of the legal profession and with due respect for the necessities of the core values of the legal profession, how they are looking at um, the possibilities of legal tech of today. And with that remark, I would like to conclude. Thank you. Before we come to a question and answer session, I would like to add perhaps one comment or add to your thought of changing profiles. Um, we do a lot of testing um, legal tech propositions. And although I believe we are tech minded, the number of lawyers who are really able to talk to developers of products is very limited. And then I looked at what the universities do and the number of universities in Germany who really care about enabling the students to talk tech is rather limited. Yeah? Is it two digits, is it three, is it a handful, but certainly not more. And that's something that must change. Universities have the tradition of keeping their curriculum for as long as it possibly can. But I have taken up the point in talking to law schools that they need to change. Yeah. And I think you all should take the initiative of talking to your own schools and make them aware that they need to prepare the next generation of lawyers in order to prevent that they feel lost and former generations apparently do. Can I add a remark to that? That, ought to be, that remark that Thomas Gaster I just made ought to be taken very, very seriously by the small and medium-sized law firms because the larger law firms, they do that training in-house. He is from a larger law firm, I am from a larger law firm. We do that in-house. We have the means and we have the teaching f abilities uh, in-house. In other words, we are making that uh, progress internally that the lawyers going to medium-sized and smaller-sized law firms are missing out in their university training. This is, I think this is for the structure of the legal profession and for the members in, sm in small and medium firms. 
It's absolutely a vital remark. You, you'll be lost, you'll lose. The distance between the bigger ones and the smaller ones will grow. And the bigger ones have learned in that respect very much from the progress that has been made in this respect by the accountant, by the accountants. The accounting profession has gone this way very early on. Uh, because numbers, of course, lend themselves much easier to digitalization and to replacement mm -hmm. of brain power by digital power than the analysis of a contract or the analysis of case law and, and, and. But we learn from it, and um, that is why some of the big firms are now miles ahead of the rest of the legal profession. This is an issue, Thomas, I'm, I'm very glad you made that point. Mm -hmm. This is an issue on which the future of the legal profession at large in the entire market of legal services in mm -hmm. our country will depend more than on anything else. With that, we open up the floor to questions. Yes, sir. So I immediately um, come up to your, to your um, demands to law faculties. So what, what should law faculties do? Should they teach programming? Should they teach coding? What, what are your wishes to, to law faculties? It starts, it starts first of all with the use of the existing digital technology, which, mean, which is not being taught at the at university level. Um, the, it would also be helpful, i.e., get familiar, get familiar with uh, how do you really tap on the existing data banks. And there are many, many of such banks. How do you work with the existing tools already? But then it would also be helpful to write computer, learn to get some basic knowledge of writing your own computer programs. Because what you need to do eventually in your law firm is you need to write your own um, program for software administration. You, in, when I say you need to write it yourself, that doesn't mean you do it yourself but you need a programmer whom you can take by, by his hand. So you need to work together with him. And you can work together with a professional from another profession only when you have some basic understanding of what he does and he has some basic understanding of what you are doing. Uh, if that is not there, you can't even judge whether this one or that one as a, as a computer programmer is better for your firm. You are lost. I think I see two, two developments, if I may take up your question. Mm. There is a gap in the law firm, so it will soon be, and it will be filled by two types of professional. One of them, who had always a focus on organizing legal work as a project, perhaps, and have the ability or gain the ability really to code. And they will be the interface to the professional suppliers. They could be, as an example, come from Fachhochschule, could be diploma jurist, and specialize on top of that. On the other side, those who come from the law schools must have the ability to understand what someone who is more technical-minded um, explains to them, yeah. and to communicate in a way that the other one understands what the lawyer feels. So in, in yeah. it, it is um, not just an issue for the law schools, the traditional universities, but also for the others. May I add to that? Thomas Gaster just mentioned the, the uh, uh, students at Fachhochschulen, Diplom Wirtschaftsjuristen. Oh. I have the impression they are better trained at, tech, uh, at, at legal tech than university students, which will mean eventually when they make an inroad, uh, and they, they've tried that several times into legal services, mm -hmm. um, they'll eventually get the same practice rights as fully trained university lawyers. And the quality argument then works against lawyers because based on 
when they specialize, for instance, in, in, in uh, uh, air traffic law, um, damage claims for delays of, uh, of flights, um, uh, the computer program that exists in such a narrow field is faster and better even than a specialized lawyer in that field. He may know everything that the computer knows, but the, law, the computer is faster. So um, to make use of this tool, who makes use of that tool is faster, and that can also be a, a diplom Wirtschaftsjurist, which will mean speed and quality is a better service for the, for the client, and that means there goes the monopoly down the drain. Um, probably to add to that question is what law schools can do, and I think it's not, as, as you said, it's not only on law schools to contribute to that development. I think there are some really bright ideas. Just a couple of weeks I met at the Tech Quartier students from, uh, from the Frankfurt University, and they are about to set up a lab that works together uh, with companies, that works together with coders, and I think that's a very bright initiative, and I think we just need to share uh, the, the, the cooperation and the burden of cooperating there to make something bigger and something more meaningful. So the responsibility is clearly not only on, on the universities, but also on companies and others. I'm sorry, I just wanted to add to that. Um, the problem is a structural problem. Core competencies are not taught at universities. And if they're not relevant for the state exam, students are not gonna care. Primarily, what they're focused on are their marks, because that's what, what's important to the law firms and the governments who hire them. So as long as the structural problem that everything is so much streamlined to getting a good grade is not changed, no matter what competencies you ask for, be it business competencies or even technical competencies, students are not going to care about that. So would you think that now that more competencies are asked from students, that the system as a whole must be re re rethought? I'm not sure whether the entire system must be redone. I mean, that this is a discussion that exists as long as I can remember from the days I was a student. Um, and there have been certain adjustments, but I would also like to, let's say, challenge your statement that students will not learn what they are not tested on. Why is it possible for Boselius Law School to develop that program which has a substantial intake, which students really like? They know that they will not be, let's say, tested, but they know that their employers will want to see that skills. Of course, I agree in principle that our, let's say, legal training is too much geared at the judiciary and not at other professions, legal professions, but um, um, if we want to wait till this is redone entirely, we will not achieve anything on the legal tech front. I, I fully share what Thomas Gaster had just said, and I can, I can give you a bit of, of, of own experience. He's quoting the Buceos Law School example. I've been, I've been teaching European company law at Heidelberg University for over 20 years now. And um, when I started, um, European company law did not exist at all in the curriculum of university education of young lawyers, not at all. And nevertheless, um, I started right from the outset with 15 students, first semester, 15 students. That shows that there is a great interest of good students to give their own education a certain profile. They try to define their course of studies so that they think they have a good chance to find a good job with a good employer afterwards. I'm as skeptical as Thomas Gasteyer as regards the inclusion of legal tech abilities in the official curriculum of law studies at university. That's absolutely hopeless to de ask that from the, from the lender in Germany is counterproductive because they feel that that's their sovereignty. Now, the university should offer it to the students and then simply rely on the students that they will go to these classes because they realize that that is 
one of the, the second most important criterion for successful career in law afterwards. Good grades in law and the ability to deal with technology. Yes, um, beside this uh, structural problem concerning the education, there is a second structural problem, I believe, and that boils down to money. Y you mentioned, uh, Professor Helwig, that, um, that the big law firms are way ahead in terms of legal tech compared to small and medium-sized yeah. law firms. Well, at the end of the day, if you see what Beck asks for, for its online access, um, that might be, uh, and the economy of scale that is uh, that, that is realized for in big law firms, there is no wonder that smaller law firms just cannot afford the amount of money necessary to get the same degree of access. All the more, it is important to know that, I know that at least for Bavaria, that the judges have total access to this online data uh, offered by Back Online and others. And others. Um, for free, well, for them personally, for free. It is not for free, as a matter of course. Um, and here it, it, it touches a point which we call in German Waffengleichheit, so the equal playground between somebody who is represented by a small lawyer compared uh, to the judge who has another degree of access to, to, to information and maybe, uh, maybe the opposite side who has a big law firm who is, has, again, another degree. My question to you, gentlemen, as representatives from the lawyer's profession, are there ideas, are there recommendations or proposals to give access, to give access for free for small and medium-sized law firms to this amount of crucial data? I'm not aware of it, and I don't think it will ever come. Uh, the problem existed already at the times um, when, when the law was laid down in books uh, and the court decisions were laid down in, in, in books and publications. As a small lawyer, as a small lawyer you, uh, uh, you, you had a small library, a larger law firm has a larger financial basis to have a larger library. What you can do as a lawyer in such a case uh, is uh, what you did, used to do in the past, uh, you would go to the library of the court and uh, there you had all the books that you needed. And um, if, the, if, the, um, if the, the library at the, at the local court wasn't good enough, uh, you would have to uh, do uh, long distance um, uh, borrowing of books from, from another library, uh, including the, the Deutsche Nationalbibliothek. Um, I think the situation that I've just described is similar to the, to the situation of access to, to uh, digital uh, storing of, 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 of data. Um, after all, um, uh, Beck Publishing House and the other publishing houses, uh, they, want to, they want to get paid for uh, whichever work they do. Um, and um, what, one, what one should, uh, as, as the legal profession, that's something for the professional organizations um, to, to look into, one could ask that just as like a, law, a law, lawyer can go to the local library of the court, he should also be able to share, to use the digital access at the courthouse, which is for free for the judges. That, I think, would be, would be the solution. Um, but I don't think that um, a solution will ever come uh, that for the entire territory in the country, um, all the lawyers get free access uh, that cannot afford it in order to be on an equal footing uh, with the bigger law firms. In a way, the, the answer of the profession has been to improve the ability to specialize, yeah, Fachanwalt, and so because this really helps you to limit the, the need for resources. But in a more general way, um, isn't it strange that now the government, I mean the courts, are forcing the legal profession to become more, um, let's say, technically wise, the bear imposed on us because the public sector is more efficient than the legal profession? Can we really hope that they will fund us in order to further improve or rather avoid that we need to make investments? I wouldn't feel comfortable with it, aside from the issue that it's not realistic. 
Um, not even hardware infrastructure is considered something that should be free. Should knowledge be totally free? Would the government pay for it? I don't see it. I think also that lawyers have to get their act together and improve how they are working. Thank you very much. Now we're running into the break. Um, at last, we have one, not so much a question, but a footnote that one gentleman would like to make. Yes, hello. Um, it's my function to be the human footnote to the <laughs> Professor Helbig's talk. Um, it's just he was talking about um, how there is no point in resisting the use of legal tech, um, and indeed that's obviously so. But um, as one uses it, it's necessary to do so in a manner that, for example, uh, achieves all you can achieve to protect uh, professional secrecy, legal professional privilege, and so forth. And so a little footnote coming from the CCBE, for the IT um, panel committee, uh, of which I'm a member, and the surveillance working party, which I share, chair, have um, produced some very valuable um, resource materials which have been approved by the CCBE and are on the CCBE website. One's a set of recommendations about protection of um, lawyers' data um, from surveillance. That's mainly directed at governments and regulators, but it's useful. But directed at um, lawyers, there's um, guidelines on uh, practical measures that can be taken to minimize the risk of exposure of data and breaching of LPP. And there's also, um, slightly older, but still only a couple of years old, guidance on use of cloud computing. So could I exhort everybody to just go to the CCBE website where you can download that and you might find it helpful. Thank you very much. Can, yes, sir. I, I think that was a very constructive and very useful remark that you just heard. But uh, I would link it with what I said earlier on. When you download the CCBE recommendations in IT and IT protection, um, you have difficulties understanding that unless you have some pre-knowledge of the subject matter. And um, the specialists in the IT committee of the CCBE, they have it. Yes. But when, when remembering some of the meetings in the CCBE, the standing committee in particular, where the generalists are sitting, I can assure you they had very little idea of what the IT committee recommended. <laughs> A very heartfelt thank you to Professors Gasteyer and Helwig. Thank you. Now, my dear ladies and gentlemen, we find ourselves at my personal favorite part of the day. The Italians have their espresso, the British have their tea and biscuits, the Germans have cafe and kuchen. <laughs> Please, I invite you to go out and enjoy some of our coffee specialties as well as delicious German cake. We will reconvene in the two smaller rooms across the hall um, for one final presentation at 17.45. That's 5.45 p.m. Thank you very much. <laughs>